I'm grateful for a worship community that proclaims things like, all the earth will shout your praise, our hearts will cry, these bones will sing, great are you, Lord, it's your breath in our lungs. Because there's something about knowing that even when I don't know the words to pray, or even when I don't know the lyrics to the song, that just in my breathing, that God is with me. That just in my knowing, just in who I am, in my heart beating and in my breathing, that God deserves our praise. That God loves us so much. I brought a little gift for y'all this morning, and I hope you like it. I began to think about what I might bring for you this morning and, and what we might talk about in this sermon series, God Is. And, you know, there was a lot of different things I thought about, but it needed to be enough for all of you. And so I began to think about small quantities of things or things that we could each touch or take away from. And, um, well, I know that sand is in small quantities, right? We, you know, little grains of sand. But, you know, we don't live near the beach, unfortunately. So I brought you something else. I brought you dirt. <laughs> I was hoping you'd be a little bit more happy with it. <laughs> yeah. Good morning, by the way. My name is Julie uh, Klausner. I am one of the pastors here on staff, uh, along with Rich, and I get to play with dirt this morning, so that's pretty cool. Um, I grew up in East Texas, and in East Texas, the dirt doesn't exactly look like this. It's a little bit more red. It's kind of a clay dirt. Uh, but in East Texas, we uh, uh, do this little thing called mudding, <laughs> where you take your truck out into the uh, field, and um, well, if it's uh, wet enough to, you begin to turn it in a lot of circles, and if you're lucky, you get it stuck. Now, I've never been mudding, but I have been in a field out at our farm before after it's rained and gotten my truck stuck. And if you've ever gotten your truck stuck in mud before, what you learn very quickly is that the intuitive thing to do, to, you know, to press down on the gas and to really start gunning it, doesn't actually help you out at all. In fact, when you start pushing down on the gas, the wheels just start turning faster, and that just kicks up more dirt, which makes the hole that you're in a little bit deeper, which makes your mess a little bit worse. So then you end up getting one or two other people and you begin to kind of push it out. And if you're lucky, you get it all over you because it just digs a deeper hole and you just get more mud on you. So then you end up having to either get it towed out or wait until the, uh, the uh, dirt is dry enough to get it out or you go and get gravel. But it's a really messy process. We're in this sermon series called God Is, and last week we talked about how God is confounding, how God is not all the things that we can say in one word or phrase, and um, how there's a lot to God that we don't know. In the midst of things that we feel like we do know, there's a lot that we don't know. And so we talked about how God is confounding. This week we're talking about how God is hope. God is hope. That word hope you might have heard before, especially if you've been in the church before, that word is a, a word we like to use a lot in the church. It's a word that is very uh, true to our Christian faith, to who we are as people of God, to believe that there is hope. But as our team began to think about what it means to say that God is hope, what we realized is that sometimes hope gets confused for optimism. Sometimes hope gets confused for something that is um, blissful, maybe ignorantly blissful, something that is not exactly real. And we began to talk about it, and we began to realize that hope is really not the absence of something, but instead something that is in the midst of something that's going on. And we began to think about it and said, well, hope is a four-letter word. <laughs> hope is a dirty word. Because it seems as though when we find hope, it's not in the blissful situations, it's not in life's happiest moments, but instead we tend to find hope in the dirtiest moments of our lives. When we get stuck, when the wheels start turning and the faster we push the gas, the digger of a hole that we build. Hope is not in the absence, but in the midst of. Hope is sometimes something that we find in the midst of the mess, in the midst of a really tough time. 
So the scripture I want to talk to you about today talks about a messy story. There's a lot of scriptures in the Bible that talk about really great stories with really beautiful happy endings, but today, if we've got dirt in the room, I think we ought to deal with a messy story. So we're going to look at this story from John 11, and it's a story about Jesus and his friend named Lazarus. Now, we talk about Jesus in the scripture, right, because it's in all of the Gospels. And so we hear about all of these stories of Jesus. To backtrack just a little bit, I want to tell you about this word incarnation. We talk about this word a lot at Christmas. It means that Jesus is God, that Jesus is God incarnate. That means that when Jesus was born into the world, it means that God came and dwelled among us. We believe that Jesus was fully divine and fully human. And so when we look at the stories of Jesus, we all of a sudden have a way in which to understand God more fully. Because we understand God through Jesus, and we understand Jesus through the stories we find in our scriptures. So this scripture story that we have today comes from John 11. And what's just happened in the scripture is that Lazarus, Jesus' friend, has, has suddenly died. And so Jesus is going to go meet with the family to go be with the family and friends of uh, the person that has just died. But Lazarus was a dear friend to him. So he's also going personally to go and check out and see what has happened. So I want to start off in this story in verse 31 of John 11. It says, The Jews who were with her in the house, talking about Mary, consoling her, saw Mary get up quickly and go out. They followed her because they thought that she was going to the tomb to weep there. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been there, my brother would have not died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. They said, see how he loved him. Before anything else goes on in this story, there's grieving to do. Because a friend has died. Because there's heartbreak that has happened. And I find it interesting in this story that when Jesus could have gone and been the Savior, been there to fix everything, the first thing that he does is not say, I've got the answer, I've got the solution. He begins to cry with them recognizing not only their tears, but his own tears. It's said that Jesus came not just to teach us who God is, but to teach us who we are. And there's something about Jesus' tears in this scripture that tells us that we're not alone. I have a dear friend that says, if your tears could talk, what would they say? And I wonder today, if Jesus' tears could talk, what would they say? I think they would say something about heartbreak. I think they would say something about the human experience and that it's not a life without pain and without sorrow. And that to be human is to have tears. To know struggle and to know pain is to be a person who cries. And even in those most difficult moments, what Jesus does, fully divine and fully human, is tells us that we don't cry alone that God cries with us, that maybe God won't come and save us from the situations and give us a different situation, but even in the midst of our tears, that God cries with us. Jürgen Maltman says it like this, nothing can cut us off from the companionship of God through Jesus Christ, who lives and celebrates and suffers with us. The God of Jesus Christ is the God who is on the side of victims and sufferers in solidarity with them. What we find in Jesus' tears is a companionship with God, a recognition that there is something alike between us and God. Not just the human part, but the real raw part, the dirty part, the messy part of life, the struggle, the pain and the hurt. So Jesus goes and he's weeping with the friends and family. And the scripture goes on to say, Then Jesus, again greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone, Mar- Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, 
Lord, already there is a stench because he has been dead for four days. Now, yes, there's grieving to do, but Martha comes into this story and says, let's not get carried away. Martha is our practical person in the story. She is the sensible one. She is the one who, in the midst of the tears and the crying, looks at Jesus when Jesus says, let's, let's roll that stone away, and says, are you sure you want to do that, Jesus? He's been in there four days. It's going to smell really, really bad. Martha begins to question resurrection. She begins to question what it might look like. Martha's very sensible and recognizes that there is a crowd around and she does not want to cause a scene. And it's going to smell really, really bad. And what will people think? And will this look good for Jesus if he rolls away this tombstone and that is just smelly? I wonder what the cave looked like. I wonder if the cave was damp and earthy or if it was dry. But I know either way that that cave was probably dark. And sometimes I wonder what Lazarus might have thought in there. What Lazarus might have been wondering. But the cave was really dark. I wonder about the caves sometimes in our own life. They probably look a little bit different for each of us, but we all have something that we maybe wish wasn't as present, maybe wasn't as smelly, and some of us maybe wish that we could just go into a cave for a little while. And here's Martha, and I tend to resonate with Martha. Are we sure we want to roll the stone away? Because it's going to smell really bad. Is it really worth it? Whatever Jesus is about to do, is it really worth it? To have that smell come out into the open. To have that mess come out into the open. We hear Martha's voice today and we just wonder, what is she afraid of? What dark cave is she worried about in her own life? Now when we talk about hope, we talk about hope and some of us are not in hopeless situations. Some of us are just in situations where we maybe have something that we don't want to talk about. We have something that's just hiding in the cave a little bit. That thing when somebody asks you, how are you, that we don't want to say. And here's Jesus in the midst of that, in the midst of this cave, in the midst of the grieving, looking at these people and saying, let's roll away the stone. I don't care how smelly it is. I don't care how messy it is. I don't actually care what's in that cave. Let's roll away the stone. So that's what they do. In verse 38, it goes on and says, Then Jesus, again, greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. So they took away the stone. And Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here, so that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, and his hands and feet were bound with strips of cloth, and his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Jesus cried in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. Jesus uses Lazarus' name. In just a few short words, he says a lot. Let's put it this way. Have you ever had your parents say your name, and in just by saying your name, they say a lot? You can tell just by the tone of their voice that they're saying a lot of things under it. Whenever I was in high school, I spent a lot of time in my bedroom like most teenagers. And in the mornings, I would take a long time getting dressed like most teenagers. And my mom would be waiting and waiting and waiting for me patiently. Now, my mom, again, was a very patient person. But I always knew she would first start with, Julie, it's time to go. Julie, it's getting close to time. And then finally, she just dropped the end of the sentence and just went, Julie... And you knew just by the way in which she said Julie that it was time to come out, that it was time to go. She was done playing around. She was done with whatever excuses I was about to make. It was time to leave. So Jesus says Lazarus' name. And there's something about being called by your name that speaks to resurrection, 
that speaks to the fact that God calls each of us by name. And in just saying our name, we hear that recognition of maybe a time to come out of the tomb, time to come out of the cave, time to come out of the dark places in our life. So Jesus calls Lazarus out of the cave. But then this really interesting thing happens at the very end of the story. Jesus tells them, plural, to unbind him. Jesus tells the community that it is their responsibility to begin to unwrap Lazarus. Talk about messy. Talk about awkward and weird. It seems as though resurrection is not just about something that's in the future. It seems as though hope is not about bliss or wishful thinking or about the absence of struggle. It seems as though hope is messy. It's a dirty word. And in this story, Jesus calls Lazarus by name and says, I don't care how smelly it is. I don't care how far in that cave you are. I will cry with you, I will be with you, and I will be here when you're ready to come out. And when you come out of that cave, I will not unbind you, but there will be a community of people who will unbind you. That is the real gift of hope, friends. That hope is not something that we do personally, it's something we do together. It's something we do as a community. When we come to this place every Sunday, and when we are real with each other and vulnerable with each other, and our need of resurrection from something that feels either hopeless in our life or a struggle that we are having, the faith that we proclaim, the hope that we proclaim, is that we come to this community, to a community that calls us by name and says we can handle it, to a community that will help us unwrap each other to be real with each other. There's a pastor that tells a story about a Sunday when she was having a hard time. And so when she has a hard Sunday, sometimes before she gets up and preaches, she asks one of her congregation members to pray for her because pastors need prayer too, amen? <laughs> so she asks one of her, pastor, her congregation members to pray for her and her congregation member, she says to them, I'm having a really hard time. I just came out of a really difficult conversation. Would you pray for me that I can just be in this space and be with you in the coming moments in worship? And so her congregation member begins to pray for her and says, Dear God, our pastor is not in a good place right now and we need her back. So will you break her heart with our love for her and release her from the things that bind her? Break her heart with our love for her. As an access community, my prayer is that we are a community, a people of faith that knows the love that we have for each other. Because that love comes from Christ. Because that love comes from Jesus. And because Jesus is fully God and fully human, we know of a God that weeps with us, that calls us by name, that tells us that God is in the midst of the mess with us. So I told you earlier that I had a gift for you in this dirt. If you've been with us before, you might have known that we've done a baptism uh, renewal before. So in a baptism renewal, what we do is, um, we don't have buckets this big. (laughs) But in a baptism renewal, what we do is we all come forward to the water and we put our hand in the water and we say something like, you are a child of God or you are blessed to be a blessing or remember your baptism and be grateful. Well, today we don't have water, we have dirt. So instead of coming to the water this morning, we as a community are going to come to the dirt. And I'm going to invite you, we're going to do this, it's going to be a little messy, but that's who we are as a community. The theater seats will go to these outside sections. You'll see pails on the outside, and then if you're in this movable seating in the front, there are these buckets in the front that you can come to. And what I'm going to invite you to come and do is to come and just stick your hand in the dirt. 
Maybe run it through your fingers. Look at it. Maybe say your name. Maybe say, I am a child of God. If you're not a person that is maybe in a dirty situation this morning, and you think, why do I have to come and get dirt on my hands? Remember that we're not just a community of people that come to the dirt when we need dirt, but when our friends and faith need dirt, when they're in the hard places in life. So I'm going to invite you to come anyways and come to the dirt and let your heart be broken and cared for by the people around you. To know that we all come to the table together. We all come to these messy places together. Friends, hope is not found in wishful thinking. It is found in substance. It is found not in an absence of the struggle, but in the midst of the struggle. And so just like Jesus called Lazarus by name out of the tomb and the community unwrapped him, Jesus calls us today and says, I will cry with you. I will be there for you. I will weep with you. Your situation may be messy. And there may be people around you in the public that don't want it to be messy. There may be Marthas who say, let's be practical here. It stinks really bad. But I believe in a God that can deal with the mess. I believe in a God that can deal with things that smell bad and things that are a little dark. So as you come to the dirt this morning, come, touch it. We're not going to give you um, baby wipes or anything to wipe them off with. You can say thank you to Eric. He bought some uh, dry dirt, so it won't, it won't linger, I promise. But if you are a clean freak, there are maybe a few wipes in the back. But come to the dirt. Come and put your hands in it. And remember that you are loved and that there is a God in the midst of a mess. And that is the God that we proclaim today. As you come to these, um, these buckets this morning, there are baskets up at the front for offering. If you brought an offering this morning, you can come and in the midst of the dirt, bring your offering. And you can put that in the offering basket as you come by. There's also the bottom of that connect card. If you would bring that to the front as you come. And you can drop that in the basket as well as you come by. So before we move, I want to leave you with this, these words. These words are by Jan Richardson. She is a poet and an author and a woman who went through a great struggle of losing her husband a few years ago. And she began to write words down about how we live and deal and grasp a God of hope that is with us. And she wrote this thing called A Blessing for Traveling in the Dark. And I want to read it to you before we come to the dirt this morning. She says, go slow if you can, slower more slowly still. Friendly, dark, or fearsome, there is no place to break your neck by rushing, by running, by crashing into what you cannot see. Then again, it is true, different darks have different tasks, and if you have arrived here unaware, if you have come in peril or in pain, this might not be a place for you to dawdle. I do not know what these shadows ask of you, what they might hold that means good or ill for you. It is not for me to reckon whether you should linger or you should leave, but this is what I can ask of you, that in the darkness there be a blessing, that in the shadows there be a welcome, that in the night you be encompassed by a love that knows your name. Today we are encompassed by a love that knows our name, by a God who is with us in the midst of the mess. Hope is a dirty word. Thanks be to God.